Sometimes in our lives we all have pain, we all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. So please swallow your pride. If I have faith, you need to borrow for no one can fill those of your needs that you won't let show. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on so just call on me brother when you need a hand we all need somebody to lean on i just might have a problem that you'd understand we all need somebody to lean on lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend. Well, I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. So just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. Well, I just might have a problem that you'd understand we all need somebody to lean on lean on me when you're not strong and i'll be your friend i'll help you carry on for it won't be long till i'm gonna need somebody to lean on Lean on, lean on, lean on, lean on. And truer words were never spoken. To be very honest, we cannot get through life without leaning on each other. So thank you for bringing that mis message to us in song. And it, rem and it reminds us all that we are here to celebrate. We are here to celebrate Kevin's life. So it is my privilege to extend this heartfelt and cordial word of welcome to the servants of remembrance and celebration of Kevin's life. We are especially grateful for the presence of his parents, Terry and Doug, and we're also grateful for the presence of our president, uh, Neil Kerwin, and his wife, Ann, and we're also grateful for all of those of you who are going to be speaking. You're listed in the program. You will, as you're as you see the program, you're invited simply to come up and share your reflections, share your thoughts. We all remember, we all remember what was happening on July, July what happened on July the 4th. The magnitude and shock of Kevin's death staggers our minds and breaks our hearts. We have been overwhelmed by the enormity of the tragedy and that the sadness 
in some ways just doesn't seem to lift. But I want to underscore that our purpose for this gathering is to remember and to celebrate Kevin's much too short but consequential and remarkable life. In a few minutes, we are going to hear lots of stories about marvelous moments with Kevin, and he left us with lots of them. From what I know, he had a flair that would light up all interactions. He had a voracious love of life and everything about it. He was a pilgrim, not a spectator. Kevin's death and the shocking way he died has forced us all to think about the fragility and the vulnerability of our own lives and about the meaning of death. Now, I'm a university chaplain and a person of faith, but I confess I know virtually nothing about what happens after we, after we die. Many of us take comfort from our faith and our religious traditions, and I certainly do. But there's a part of me that still strives to understand, not that it is ever understandable. I will say this, we have established that Kevin was utterly unique. Those of us who knew him and loved him are grateful for the gift of his life. And like the rest of us, we are grateful to the source of all life for the incomparable gift that was bestowed on Kevin, the precious gift of his life. That's true for us all. Against all the odds, we have happened. We were born. And when you add it up, each of us has coming into being against innumerable trillions of odds to one. Yet we're here. You have to be impressed by the fact that it will always be that we have been. Even if every trace of our earthly existence were erased, even if the universe itself should cease to be, it remains that the universe and our own lives have occurred. That fact can never be erased. It gives us pause to remember that all we have been and all we have done has been. For most of us who have lived for some years, or even very short years like Kevin, our lives have sent out all kinds of ripples in the great ocean of life. I would go further. I believe that when we die, the very best of who and what we are becomes part of who and what creation God is. That our essence, our value, what is important is not lost, but becomes part of creation for all eternity. And our lives change the very face of creation. So in a way of thinking or metaphorically, we change God. We go on as part of creation God that we have become part of. Every particle of the universe is different because Kevin lived. In nature, nothing is lost, nothing destroyed. His earthly witness has been transformed. Certainly, Kevin's life had an immediate and a profound impact on your lives and on others fortunate enough to have shared space with him. His work and witness had a stunning impact for good, not only on the present generation, but also for generations to come. We are different, creation is different, because he lived and he shared his life with us. 
Morning has broken, and we are here, you and I, breathing the air, admiring the light as it refracts through these magnificent stained glass windows and dances in motes of dust above the pews, calling us to attention, calling us homeward, Unless we armor our hearts, we cannot protect ourselves from loss. We can only protect ourselves from the death of love. Yet without love, nothing matters. Break your life into a million pieces and ask yourself what of any real value might endure after you're gone. The pieces that remain will each carry love's signature. Without love, we are left only with the aching hollow of regret, that haunting emptiness where love might have been. Kevin had a voracious love for life and everything in it and everything about it, and he loved his family. He loved his friends. He loved American University. He loved his colleagues. Carl Sandburg wrote, let a joy keep you. Kevin was a joy to all who knew him, and we get to keep that. Bill Coughton says that we take consolation in the love that never dies and the dazzling grace that always is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm here today to represent the entire American University community and family to express our condolences to the family and friends of Kevin Sutherland and especially to his parents, Terry and Doug. You've suffered an unthinkable loss, but somehow you have found heroic strength and equanimity to endure in ways that would make Kevin even prouder of the parents that he loves so deeply. In the wake of this tragedy, you can take some solace in the immense outpouring of emotion, admiration, and support that attended his death. The media coverage, which was simply extraordinary, was replete with testimonials from relatives, classmates, friends, co-workers, and perfect strangers who found in Kevin's life and work something truly remarkable. The mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser, herself an alumna of American University, knew when she learned of Kevin's murder that he too was an important member of her community. She personally contacted me while I was out of the country to inform me that he had passed 
and how the government and she were responding to his loss and to offer her sympathy. Her effort shows that Kevin's life immediately resonated with those who learned even just a little of what he stood for and the life that he had led. But I'm not here only to express our shared grief. I cannot speak with the depth of insight of a father or others who shared so much with him and knew him so well. What I can do is share my memory of Kevin and in those words attempt to convey the intense pride that this great university holds for an admired alumnus taken so early and so unjustly from a world so deeply in need of his gifts. I can also suggest a way for us to honor his memory. Kevin's time at American University was marked by academic achievement, deep commitment to service, and a genuine love for the city he adopted as his second home. This university and city in return embraced him as a person who would make great contributions to what we all thought would be a long and successful life and career. As I review his record of service here at American, I is filled with positions and activities that require both deep commitment to undertake hard work without regard for the awards of recognition or even immediate personal gratification that he might enjoy. He was a man you could depend on to do the work when he agreed to take it on without worry about motives, dedication, or skill. This list of service activities is long. Two terms as Secretary of Student Government, substantial work with the College Democrats, the Kennedy Political Union, the Roosevelt Institute, the Public Relations Society, and the Turkish Student Association. The work as Student Government Secretary is emblematic of the man because it required constant attention to detail and a precision in communication that the official record of this important component of university governance relies on for accuracy, objectivity, and timeliness. Similarly, when the College Democrats needed a website, an initiative requiring a combination of his twin passions, politics, and technology, Kevin stepped up for this complex and time-consuming task. Put simply, Kevin was a go-to guy for essential and difficult work that required a great work ethic and a deep commitment again to service. I recall several conversations with Kevin. We held in common Connecticut, and we both adopted Washington as our second home. I found him mature for his years, thoughtful, balanced but enthusiastic and engaging in the views on issues that were burning here at the university at the time. With me, he was always articulate and respectful, but sufficiently unimpressed with my title. <laughs> and my authority to speak his mind frankly and directly. However deeply I love being told I'm right, we all benefit more from someone whose thoughtful analysis of a difficult situation is expressed honestly. And that was Kevin. We're all complex, and we reveal ourselves differently to the many whose lives we come into, and who come into our lives. For those parts of Kevin that were revealed to me, the words that fit best are intelligence, determination, integrity, reliability, honesty, compassion, and generosity. Reflecting now, we will all be weaker for his loss if we allow the inspiration that is the legacy of his life to fade from our work and our lives. We have no choice to accept that we have lost Kevin too soon and senselessly. We now have the choice to remember him as someone who meant so much to so many, whose ideals still shine bright, whose intelligence, diligence, creativity, and energy 
were driven by an intense desire to make this world a better place. So it falls to us, who he left behind, to ensure his legacy is as rich as the life we celebrate today. For me, we can do that by acknowledging and then acting on the message of his life, by devoting more time, more of our energy, more of our intelligence and creativity, and more enduring passion to the betterment of the world around us. We must listen more closely and allow ourselves to be persuaded by that voice that calls all of us to serve. If we, each in our own way, dedicate ourselves to act, to make the world smarter, more just, and a more inclusive place, we'll have done our part not to just honor his memory, but to fill a very large gap left by the loss of the good that Kevin would have done. For Kevin, there can be no finer legacy, no better tribute to an important life and an important life well lived. First of all, I'd like to thank every one of you for coming today. I can't tell you how much it means to me and to Kevin's entire family to have you all here to honor his memory. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Kerwin and the AU staff for giving us so much support and for helping to put this service together. AU was a very special place for Kevin. <clears throat> his four years here were among the happiest of his life. And he really came into his own with the help of his professors and an amazing group of friends. When Kevin entered AU as a freshman, he was a fairly shy, reserved young man, just feeling his way into adulthood. And AU provided him with the perfect environment to grow and mature and build his confidence. The academic environment provided Kevin with invaluable instruction but it was his experiences outside the classroom, on campus and in DC, that gave Kevin hands-on real-world experience in the political arena and prepared him for a career in politics after AU. For all of those experiences, we are exceedingly grateful. There are so many things I will miss about my son. He had so many talents. He was a true tech geek. And from an early age, he took to computers. He embraced high technology of all kinds, and he quickly became everyone's go-to tech support. Now we all have to find a new source of information on how to fix a problem with our smartphone, or what tablet to buy, or how to hook up the latest gadget to our entertainment system. We will all miss his assistance when these technical problems arise. Kevin was a talented graphic artist, and many of you in this room have probably seen his political logos for the AU College Democrats or the AU student government. He designed <clears throat> many logos for candidates for the AU student government, along with many of the posters for various events put on by the Kennedy Political Union. He designed my campaign logo when I ran for state rep in Connecticut last year. And he designed the logo for the Trumbull Democratic Town Committee in our hometown. Kevin loved using his talents to help others. And we will all miss seeing his creative mind at work. Kevin was a self-taught student of photography. He started with a simple point and shoot camera when he was young. And over the years, he progressed from simple digital SLRs to more sophisticated, state-of-the-art cameras with high-quality lenses. And along the way, he honed his craft by taking hundreds of pictures of his friends and colleagues here at AU, and hundreds more of the monuments uh, and the architecture and the sites in and around DC. He truly loved DC, and he loved photographing it. 
He displayed many of his pictures on social media and on the walls in his apartment. And very often a new and surprising photo canvas became a unique and treasured gift for Christmas or for someone's birthday. I will really miss seeing those amazing new photos pop up on Facebook, and I will really miss watching his photographic talents grow and develop. And then there was politics. When Kevin was small, <clears throat> Terry and I felt that sure that his love for computers would leave him into, lead him into engineering. But then a friend of mine got us all involved in a Connecticut race for Senate in 2006, and Kevin caught the political bug. He became a sponge for political history and current events. And while at AU, he volunteered in the White House and later in the office of our Congressman Jim Himes. And of course, here on campus, he was elected to two terms as student government secretary. His growth and maturity <clears throat> through all of these experiences was amazing for his mother and me to watch from afar. And we will miss those insightful political discussions we used to have. Over the past few years, Kevin became the technology, sports, comedy, and political news aggregator for me and Terry and all of his close friends. Several times a day, we would get news links in our inbox via Facebook or Twitter or on Google Hangout. Often before we got up in the morning, something was there that Kevin knew we would find interesting. Kevin lived for this stuff and he loved to find little nuggets that he knew each of us would enjoy. It will be a long time before my heart stops jumping every time I get a notification on my cell phone. Sadly, there will be no more nuggets coming from Kevin. They say that the eyes are the windows to the soul, and Kevin had beautiful brown eyes that revealed a kind and gentle soul. At an early age, he loved to make people laugh. He always had a smile on his face, and what a smile it was. He loved to make his grandmother laugh, often simply by staring at her and willing her to laugh, <clears throat> even when she didn't really want to. Before long, she was laughing hysterically, so hard she could hardly breathe. He pulled the same stunt on his mother when he had done something to make her mad and it almost always worked. Kevin and I had a unique ability to push each other's buttons, and occasionally we would really go at each other. But the anger was always short-lived. You just couldn't stay angry when you looked into those eyes. We will miss seeing the kindness and love in those eyes. But the thing I will miss most about my son is his passion for helping others. Kevin was always a very sensitive young man. He had a keen ability to feel the pain of others. Whether it was consoling his grandfather after the sudden death of Kevin's grandmother, grieving for the victims of Sandy Hook, or consoling a friend battling depression, Kevin could put himself in other people's shoes and he wanted to help. He was not ambitious. He was not seeking recognition or a high title. His political pursuits were driven by his desire to make a difference, to make this a better world. It was not about Kevin. A little over a year ago, he wrote a very eloquent post on his blog about the first anniversary of the Sandy Hook tragedy. And in that post, he wrote, since I am in politics, there is one phrase coined by our founding fathers that really strikes me. When they founded this nation, they set out to create a more perfect union. The important distinction is, in this phrase is that our union is not perfect. More than 225 years later, despite, despite so much change, this is still true. It is likely that we will never achieve absolute perfection, but I believe that the heart of American exceptionalism is that we will never stop trying. If history is any guide, the forces for progress always succeed eventually, no matter how formidable their opposition is. Our fight is not merely for new gun control measures 
or even new mental health programs. <clears throat> it is for the creation of an even more perfect union. So this was Kevin's life's work, to fight prejudice of any kind, to fight for equality, to fight poverty, to fight for justice, and to protect our environment, and simply to strive for a more perfect union. One of Kevin's friends told me a while back that Kevin sought to help those who couldn't help themselves, or to help them even if they could, just because he cared. That was my son, Kevin, always looking to lend a helping hand and to make life a little easier for friends and strangers alike. And that is the thing I will miss the most. And the thing that makes me the most proud to say Kevin was my son. I can't end this speech without thanking Kevin's many friends, many of whom are here today and his colleagues at New Blue Interactive. <clears throat> you guys were the wind beneath his wings. You embraced him and you encouraged him. You validated his character and you all made him exceedingly happy. And I can never thank you enough for the huge part you played in his life. We cannot change the basic facts of this tragedy, but we can control how we respond to it, as hard as that will be. We will all miss Kevin's amazing presence in our daily lives, but we must focus on the blessing he was to each of us who knew him for the, fort, for the short time that he was with us. Let us honor him by modeling our lives after his kind, gentle, and patient character and his passion for making this world a better place. In his memory, may we always look for the beauty in the world around us and in each other, and let us continue to strive as he did to create that more perfect union. Kevin, your mother and I love you. We will miss you, but we will always consider your presence in our life a true blessing from God. Thank you. true Kevin fashion, we decided to read this off of an iPad instead of paper. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here to celebrate Kevin's life with us today. Alex and I were trying to figure out what all we would say about Kevin today, and the conversation almost always turned into, remember that funny time when we... So we decided why not talk about those great times. One of the best memories I have of Kevin is when we went skydiving. As you know, Kevin was a huge daredevil. <laughs> he was not. <laughs> but he was probably the smartest one of us all and decided that instead of jumping out with us, he was going to wake up at the crack of dawn, drive us out there, and take pictures of us for no reason other than he was, that's just who he was. Afterwards, we went to a Denny's restaurant. We belted country songs the whole way home. The photos Kevin took of us are amazing. I've gone on adventures since then, and none of the photos remotely compete. He was such a gifted photographer, and a fringe benefit of being friends with him was that I always had great profile pictures, particularly of skydiving. As most of you probably know now, Kevin loved country music. It wasn't always something he loved. He picked it up right around our senior year. Being that I was from Texas, I was a pretty big fan, but I didn't have a whole lot of friends up here to celebrate it with. So I decided my next best bet was to convert some folks. Each afternoon, I'd walk into the SG offices and play some country music very softly. Slowly and slowly, I made it louder until finally Kevin was hooked. From then on, he was my go-to country, go country buddy. We'd listen to music together, go to plenty of concerts, and it even got to a point where Kevin dressed up as Brad Paisley for Halloween. <laughs> I'm going to venture to say that Ke turning Ke Kevin into a country music fan was probably one of my greatest accomplishments here at AU. <laughs> Kevin and Pollock's love of country music infected me a bit. Enough that the three of us went to a Blake Shelton concert. Not enough that I knew any of his songs once we got there. This could have been a recipe for a horrible time, but sitting between Pollock and Kevin at a country concert, it's impossible not to have a great time. 
They actually, uh, the concert was at Wrigley Stadium because they came out to visit me in Chicago and braved the Midwest last year. We ate Chicago hot dogs, which Kevin loved, Chicago pizza, which I loved, went to a baseball game and visited all the crazy tall buildings because they had great photo angles. I couldn't believe I had friends willing to travel across the country to visit me. The reason we were all able to get so close is because of our time here at AU. We had some absolutely amazing times together, working with the College Democrats, being a part of student government, and taking some great classes together. We also took some grueling classes together. One was the Campaign Management Institute, which I'm sure a few of you have taken. For those of you that don't know, it's two straight weeks of nine to five class, followed by hours and hours and hours of homework every night and over the weekends, with the goal of creating a campaign plan that any candidate could pick up and run with. On day one, one of the professors joked and pointed to Kevin and I, saying, you two are sitting together now, but this is such a grueling class, at the end you may not be friends. Kevin and I laughed and thought it was absurd. But sure enough, after working nonstop, not sleeping and under pressure, Kevin Pollock and I didn't want to spend any time together after the end of the class. I think we all wanted to scream at each other a little bit, but Pollock went to Texas for two weeks, I went to Turkey for two weeks, and we didn't talk, no cell phone service. <laughs> I came back, we were all ready to hang out again. Our hatred for each other for that little time became a really funny joke. And sometimes I learned that just being friends meant that we could be angry and move on and still be best friends. These are just a few of the memories we've built up over the years. There are too many to tell now and some we'd have to be considerably drunker to tell. <laughs> this has obviously been a very hard time for all of us. <laughs> we would have <laughs> no comment <laughs> this has honestly been a very hard time for all of us and we really honestly would like to thank you all for being there to support us and help us through the text messages emails facebook messages and even physical letters from some of you have been absolutely amazing and we really appreciate it and we want to thank kevin and his family so much for giving us an amazing six years of friendship and letting us be a part of his and your family Good afternoon. I'm Terry Flannery, the university's vice president for communication, and I want to thank Doug and Terry especially for allowing us to host the celebration of Kevin's life in the city that he loved, in the place that he loved. We're honored and really privileged to participate in this celebration. I've been asked to reflect on Kevin's time as a student leader. And so often in this work, by the time you get to know a student leader in their role, they're off to the next position or they're on their way out the door and graduated, some of you included. Um, <clears throat> so you don't get a chance to get to know them quite as well. But I had the opportunity to get to know Kevin better than most because he served those two terms in student government in two different administrations. He served as secretary, as you know, which put him in a position to lead the communication and public relations functions for the student government. And he was therefore the natural and most interested prospect to serve on two important advisory committees, one for the Board of Trustees and one for the university community that influence and advise the university's marketing and communications functions. He did so at a particularly important time in the life of the university. From 2011 to 2013, he provided valuable counsel as we implemented the university's first strategic marketing plan and branding campaign. Our strategy was bold, and our campaign gained a lot of attention in the early going, and is often the case when something is new and bold. It was not, shall we say, immediately embraced by the entire internal community. <laughs> Kevin wasn't a member of the advisory group when we devised our strategy or introduced the campaign. He arrived in his role when it was still too early to see any significant results, except for whether our efforts had registered and what the initial reactions were. The heat was on, and he took his advisory roles very seriously. He dove into the research that shaped our strategy, and he took the time to understand why we chose the path we took. He was an incredible listener. As he took it all in, I learned that underneath that natural, quiet, some would say shy exterior was a thoughtful, strategic thinker, a natural political analyst, and a source of great humor. I realized that if we gave Kevin the time and the space to speak, great insight would be shared. 
often served up with and eliciting great laughter. The role he was in was a tough one for any student leader. Representatives of student government need to remember who elected them, right guys? <clears throat> and while they advocate for students they represent, they don't want to be co-opted by the university's administration. Most students serve in the role Kevin served in as a translator. But it's difficult for them to participate in or influence university decisions and then advocate for the outcome, especially if it's likely to alienate some of their constituents. Kevin was extremely unusual in this regard. When he arrived at the conclusion that our strategy was sound, he actively participated in efforts to refine the campaign so that students would understand and embrace it, and he wasn't afraid to advocate for it. From several corners of the university came the idea that we needed events for students that would enhance their identification with the campaign. From the board advisory committee that he served on came the idea that an award that celebrates what it means to be a wonk might help students understand and support it. Kevin thought that the student body should present the award to a recipient that embodies the traits that we admire, that the term was meant to convey. Someone smart, passionate, engaged, and laser focused on using their knowledge to create change on the most important issues facing our time. And that's how Wonka the Year was born. He worked with his um, SG vice president and the newly directed, uh, new director of the Kennedy Political Union, Alex, to cultivate support for the strategy. And together, we constructed a list of our top five candidates to be the first recipient of the award. Well, we struck gold on the very first try. President Bill Clinton accepted the invitation to speak to our students and received the first American University Wonk of the Year Award. The night of the event, the atmosphere was electric. Prior to the event, as student government, KPU, faculty, and university leaders had their photo op moment with the former president, the line to get into Bender snaked up the hill, past Glover Gate, and down Massachusetts Avenue. A few notable opponents of the campaign protested outside Bender as a full house assembled. Kevin was in the front row, and as President Clinton gleefully accepted the award with a hearty laugh, he proceeded to regale the crowd with the tale of James Carville addressing, uh, advising him as he ran for the nation's highest office the first time. Carville, said Clinton, told him, you can be a redneck or you can be a wonk, but there ain't never been no redneck wonk. <laughs> and the crowd roared. And then President Clinton said that he always liked being called a wonk because he figured that Americans would want a president who actually knew something. And that was it. Kevin, sitting in that front row, looked back at me with that wide, ridiculous grin. He tweeted that night that he thought we'd turned a corner with the students on the campaign. So that wasn't our only adventure together, but it best describes the courage and the conviction that Kevin Sutherland represented when he came to positions that mattered. I've always been grateful for his willingness to stand with me. I was fully aware of what Kevin did for AU and for me personally, but I didn't realize how much influence I'd had on him until I was notified in the spring of 2013 that I'd been invited to the student government transition ceremony. I hadn't even known there was such a thing. <clears throat> I was supposed to receive an award, and I was presented the secretary's award for the administrator who'd done the most to support the student body that year. I was astounded, and he had that ridiculous grin again. He presented me with a certificate that's posted on my bulletin board in my office. It's there every day when I turn on the light over my desk to remind me of the rewards that come with working with bright and talented students like Kevin. After Kevin graduated, we stayed in periodic touch, usually via Twitter, and it became apparent how formidable his knowledge of digital strategy and communications and art and photography were becoming just really powerful. His skills matched with his political passion and his savvy were already forging a path to a promising career. He was creating a very bright future for himself and his country in Washington, surrounded by a network of friends and colleagues. When I heard the news, I was watching the end of the HBO series, John Adams. Did you know that John Adams and his friend and rival, Thomas Jefferson, died on the same day, July 4th, 50 years to the day after they declared the nation's independence. 
I just find it fitting that if Kevin Sutherland was meant to leave us, he would do so on the way to celebrate the 4th of July with friends in the nation's capital. Thank you. I probably won't finish. But I will start. Kevin sat in the back corner of class and this was no accident. He didn't sit in the front row. That wasn't him. He didn't want to be right in the professor's face. He didn't sit right directly so it always look at him like this other student did who really wanted to be seen, even though the other student wasn't the best student. <laughs> <laughs> what sitting in the corner did was let Kevin look down both wings of the table and across to every student to listen and observe. And then, in those times, he felt it was appropriate to speak and contribute, he did. And I could easily see he wanted to speak. You know he was kind of tall, and the chairs were a little bit small. This was in the Mary Graydon Center on the third floor. And he sort of would hunch up like this. And Terry, you're right. It wasn't a smile. It was a ridiculous grin. And then it was so exciting for me to just nod or say, Kevin, that's all you needed to do. There wasn't the raising of the hands, the noise, the clatter. Uh, and it was very concise and very cogent. He was wonderful. This was a social media class that Pallavi, who's here, created that Kevin really connected to. And then his career was into that. Kevin participated and never dominated. He was a wonderful student. I do not say that about all students. In late July, I checked on Facebook, hoping for something, and sure enough, there was a message from Kevin that he had sent about a year and a half prior after class was over. Succinct, Professor Talon, here's my website that you had us create in class. I updated it, just wanted to let you see it. I saw it, and I learned what I didn't know that he was a heck of a photographer. And that was wonderful to learn. And I purchased one of those pictures, Blue Angels, put out in a mug, and that mug staying in my office. You'll have to take me and the mug out at the same time. <laughs> he was a real subtle guy, a sweet guy and a smart guy. And Terry, Ridiculous grin is so right. Monica Patel, where are you? You shared something, and I thank you for sharing it. Monica and Kevin were talking about classes in school, and he asked, even though he was graduated and out in the real world, unquote, what well, classes are your teachers? And she said, Professor Talon. He said, oh, he's the man. <laughs> Kevin's the man. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abby. Um, this is Tia. And we lived with Kevin for three years. Um, I met Kevin my sophomore year of college in student government, and Tia and I were roommates, and we thought it was a great idea at the end of our sophomore year to form a, an apartment in roommateship with Kevin and Pollock, um, and it ended up being the best three years of our lives. Um, Kevin was one of my best friends. Uh, he was my older brother. He was my date to a lot of functions along with Pollock when I did not have another date to bring. So 
<laughs> um, five years ago, um, this Sunday, I walked around campus with Tia and my two other roommates from freshman year, and we found all the buildings to our classes, Hearst, Ford, and I laughed at the people who had classes in Watkins and Beagley. Um, we probably had lanyards around our necks, and we didn't know the concept of the N2, the N4, the N6 buses. Um, we still don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> We had just embarked on an entirely new adventure, and I was scared out of my mind. I had never left Ohio, and 90% of my family and friends stayed there. Five years later, I never imagined I would have found a family at this university. I never imagined I would stand here, back at the flaming cupcake, <laughs> speaking to you now. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and for being our family. Kevin and I had a quintessential sibling relationship. We could fight like cats and dogs. But at the end of the day, we would do anything for each other. Mess with one of us, and you would find the other close behind, fiercely defending the other. We were a team, a family, and that is one of the things I will miss most about him his loyalty. Kevin always took care of me and took care of Tia. He would always drive places, as Pollock and Alex mentioned, he drove us skydiving an hour away. <laughs> Waking up at the crack of dawn, he drove us to concerts, he drove us to Costco, he drove us anywhere. He would always entertain my crazy ideas whenever I would get a spout of energy or silliness in the apartment. He always, along with entertaining my crazy ideas, he entertained my weird quirks, me, my forgetfulness. I tended to leave my apartment key in the apartment a lot. So Kevin um, woke up uh, many a times to let me into the apartment. <laughs> um, and he did it with a smile on his face, and he didn't hate me for it, because <laughs> I probably would have hated him for it for waking me up. <laughs> yeah, and Tia definitely hated me for it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I always call it Kevin. <laughs> in a generation of mentioning we should grab drinks in passing or making plans and secretly hoping they fall apart, I am thankful now that Kevin dragged me to places he wanted to go to. From politics and pints to drink festivals, concerts, and giving me the confidence to run in student government elections and sitting with me for hours designing my logos Kevin never bailed. Kevin's loyalty was unending, and he proudly displayed what he believed in, and he would never back down. That was also often a cause for a lot of our fights, but when it was on your side, he would do anything for you. He always found a way to make something work. Whenever we talked about plans, um, the most recent concert we went to was a Mumford & Sons concert. I was like, well, it's a Wednesday night, it's a work night. And he's like, I'll just drive, it's fine. I was like, Kevin, what? <laughs> what? He just would always, always offer. He would always do it. So something I hope we can all take away from this is to follow through. Netflix, Netflix will still be queued up at your house. Your PJs will still await you. Don't fail. I regret the things that Kevin and I always put off. We always said we would go to the Red Mass one of these days. We were supposed to go last October, but I'm pretty sure the reason why we bailed was because we had a brunch reservation and we decided that was more important <laughs> and we would go next year. So at least we got brunch, but we didn't have our RBG sighting at St. Matt's Cathedral. Or another thing we always said was that we would need to have his cousin Anita and her family over to our apartment for dinner. And those are, those are one of the things that we never did because we always thought, it'll be there next week, it'll be there next month. Those events, while recurring or easily planned, don't sit dormant forever. What are we waiting for? Hold your memories of Kevin close. Admittedly, I do not remember the last time I saw Kevin. And I think about it every day. I know it was probably saying bye to each other in the apartment, but just like I said to not bail, pay more attention. Be present 
and cherish every moment with your loved ones. You don't realize how ingrained your life, how ingrained someone was in your life until they are ripped from your everyday life. In these bodies, we will live. In these bodies, we will die. Where you invest your love, you invest your life. That is a song lyric um, by a song by Mumford and Sons, the last concert that Kevin and I went together. Kevin invested his love and life into us, into this city. As we move, as we slowly move forward, we have to learn to live this, to love this city again. I admittedly am feeling quite discouraged and wondering if I'm ever going to feel the magic again that Kevin always felt and captured in his photographs. But we must rebuild, and I believe that we will as a community, and because I believe, I truly believe it's what Kevin wants. His work was not finished, and neither is ours. We will persevere together. Don't forget to check in on each other. Don't block yourself out. This is going to take a long time, but this is why we are family. Kevin, I love you, and I miss you every day. I miss your laugh. I miss your whistle that I could hear all the way down the hall or through my bedroom when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> and he's just whistling away. <laughs> I'm working on finding as many Pope Francis articles and puppy videos as you always found, and I will persevere in finding as many and having as many Joe Kennedy sightings as possible. Kevin... I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces. I'll always think of you that way. I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. That Saturday morning, I woke up, and in typical Kevin fashion, <laughs> our apartment was filled with smoke because he was burning the bacon on the stove. <laughs> I remember yelling, oh my gosh, Kevin, can you open a window or something, please? And the only thing he could do was laugh and flash his charismatic smile or his ridiculous grin that everyone knew him for. Right before he left the house, I yelled, see you, Kev, not realizing that in a couple of hours, everything would be changed forever. I'll never forget those next couple of hours. I literally felt my world drained from me, and it seemed as if the world had stopped. I thought I knew life, but I really didn't until that day. Eight, excuse me, eight weeks later, and I really still don't have an understanding to why our brother, our roommate, and our best friend was taken from us so soon. In just a few short weeks, Abigail and I not only lost Kevin, but we also lost another dear friend with us, Matt Schlonsky, in a senseless act of violence. Our world has only gotten darker before we've been able to see the light. I have come to terms that the beauty of life is that you don't know what may happen tomorrow but these are the greatest gifts of life that we must hold on to forever. There are two important life lessons that I've come to learn. The power of love and the power of acceptance. The power of love. For a long time, I was angry and I was distraught. I was mad at myself for yelling at Kevin that morning. I was mad at Kevin for getting on the train. I was mad at the world for not protecting and saving Kevin. I found myself stuck, I found myself angry that Kevin was gone and I couldn't do anything to help him. If it wasn't for all of you that are sitting in front of us today, I probably wouldn't have made it through my darkest days. The love and support that we have all learned to share during these times have helped me move past my anger. The connections, the bonds, the love, the nurturing, the stories, the memories, both good and bad, that we've created and shared during this time have helped me pay homage to our loss. By letting our love shine, Kevin is forever in our hearts, our minds, and our dreams. The power of acceptance. The grieving process isn't easy for anyone. I spent weeks in denial and not truly believed that all of this 
was too good to be true. I continue to think if only I would have done something differently. Depression took over when I kept telling myself I'm heartbroken and I will never get through this. But I had to realize the fact that Kevin is now our angel and I needed to move forward. Kevin was the most lighthearted and easy spirit person. And for that, I was able to learn into life again. Life doesn't allow you to move forward without acceptance. Kevin's death was a hard hit for all of us, but we don't have to wait for someone to pass to change the way we live. Kevin has taught me that every day we have the chance to create a life with purpose and with meaning. To my angel that is now watching over all of us, time has ceased, but the cherished memories will forever linger. This is the way of life and of all things. We shall meet again. As your love remains standing eternally by my side. Rest easy, brother. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner